again for the opportunity to come into your house. Thank you for your people, your children. Lord, the worship this morning was rich. And we thank you for your presence. And now, Lord, the word goes forth. And we pray, God, that we find good ground, Lord, in our spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. My subject this morning is God is amazing. God is amazing. Hallelujah. We're terrified by rumors. We're afraid concerning rumors. And what is a rumor? It's something that people say that's not verified usually. And it's associated with negative news. And as a result, a lot of people are losing their spiritual composure because they're listening to what I call yellow journalism. Mm -hmm. Everyone's predicting, everyone is trying to say what's going to happen. Everyone is trying to say, well, this is the next move that God's going to do. Hey, listen, let's be quite frank about it. No one really knows exactly what's going to take place in the days to come. Amen? Amen. Amen. We have prophecies in the Bible, and thank God for prophecies. Amen. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and 6, And you shall hear of wars, amen, and rumors of wars. Right. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. In Mark 13 and 7, he said, And when you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars... Be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in divers places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. We as Christians need to recite the verse that Paul the Apostle said in Acts 20 and verse 24. <coughs> but none of these things move me. Amen. Come on. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy, Amen. not doing gloom, Hallelujah. and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. I want to bring you back to a passage of scripture that's one of my favorites in the Bible. And you'll see why I'm pointing it out to you, that why God is so amazing. In the book of Luke, chapter 24 and verse 13, And behold, two of them, two of the disciples, after the crucifixion of Jesus, were walking home to their village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs, which was about seven and one half miles. So the crucifixion took place. These two disciples saw it. They saw Christ die on the cross and so on and so forth. And then they went home to have a big dis discussion for seven and a half miles. And the Bible says in Luke 24 and verse 28, And they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. Now Jesus appears to these two disciples, and he's walking with them. But they constrained him not, saying, Abide with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. Now what was happening here? Jesus was walking along with them. He appears to them, and he's saying, What's your conversation? And they said, Well, haven't you heard? I mean, haven't you read the headlines in the Jerusalem Gazette? They, they crucified Jesus. Oh, really? And Jesus is playing sort of like Lieutenant Colombo, you know? Like, oh, really? Well, tell me what happened. I'd, I'd like to know more. And he's having this conversation with him. And he would have walked on. But they constrained him. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. God, open our eyes in the last day. Open our eyes, O oh God. Open our spirit. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened us to the scriptures? Listen, we have to allow God's word to burn in us. Amen. Hallelujah. We need the light of God. So what happens? These two disciples decide we got to go back to Jerusalem and tell our brothers and sisters that we walked with Jesus. We didn't even recognize him until we constrained him to come into our house and he broke bread and then we knew who he was. Amen. Listen carefully now. In Luke 24, 33. And they rose up the same hour. The same hour. They just walked seven and a half miles. They had lunch with Jesus. He broke bread. 
they knew him and returned to Jerusalem seven and a half miles back, okay, and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is indeed risen, and he has appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. Listen to this now. Guess who shows up? Luke 24, verse 36. God is amazing. And as, he, as they thus spake, Jesus himself Hallelujah. stood in the midst of them and Lord. said unto them, Peace be unto you. Oh, what happened here? What happened? God is amazing. He was walking on the road to Emmaus. He was gone. Hallelujah. They constrained him. He broke bread. And these disciples walked back seven and a half miles. And guess who showed up? Jesus. Hallelujah. You don't find that amazing. I don't know. You, you got to be dead this morning. You got you to be like brain dead in a coma. And what happened? But they were terrified. And are frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? You know, we could say the same thing right this morning to us. Why are we so troubled? Oh, did you hear the latest? What's the latest? Oh, now you don't even have to tap your, your credit card. Now they're going to have a device where you can wave. Okay. Okay. I get it. We've been reading about a cashless society for the last 50 years. That's right. That's right. I have books in my library that were written many, many years ago talking about the mark, the cashless society, and all the stuff that's going to take place. We know it's going to take place. That's right. And people dwell on that. And they stay there. And Christians are dwelling on it. And there's so many Christians that are scared to death this morning. They're so frightened. What does it mean? They were terrified. They were so terrified when Jesus showed up. It means to descend from an erect position to a prostrate, prostrate position. It means to fall down. They were thrusted down. When Jesus appeared, I believe what the Bible is saying here, they descended and were slain in the spirit. That's what the word terrified means. They were so overtaken by the power of the spirit of God. And not only were they terrified, but they were frightened. They were thrown into fear. And they were troubled. So many people are troubled. And what does it mean? They were agitated. They had inward commotion. The world took away their calmness is exactly what's happening to us as Christians today. The world is trying to take away our calmness, our level-headedness, and self-control of the mind. People are panicking. Oh, I'm moving. I'm going. Did you hear what they're doing? I'm going to get out of here. And where are you going? Where are you going? Tell me. Are you being led by the Spirit of God? People are in a panic. Do you hear what the governor's doing? Who cares? That's right. Right. <clears throat> we know what she's going to do. She's a liberal governor. Yeah, that's right. Right. Is it a mystery to us? No. And we start to shake in our boots and we start to get so terrified and troubled that we get so stirred up. That's all we talk about. The world's coming to an end. The city's on fire. We're all going to die. The atom bomb is coming. The crazy guy in North Korea is going to set off a nuclear weapon and so on and so forth. And if he did, could you catch it in your backyard? <laughs> Think about it. We're so unraveled as Christians. And we're not holding on to the horns of the altar. And we're not holding on to the hand of Jesus. And we're troubled. And the thoughts, it means our imagination, doubts, disputes, the thinking of a man deliberating with himself. Well, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. We're going to serve God. We're going to go forward. We're going to march as an army. We're going to beat to the drumbeat of heaven. That's what God says to do. He told that to Joshua. Just go forward. Tell the people, go forward. Jesus said to the disciples in John 14 and 1, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Yeah. Why? You believe in God, <laughs> believe also in me, Jesus said. What does it mean, your heart? It's your feelings, your emotions. And we're allowing feelings and emotions to escape us and to negativity. Did you hear? People's conversation, did you hear? Did you hear what they're doing? Did you hear what they're doing? 
Please tell me what God's doing in your life. Amen. Amen. Yes. Please tell me the scripture that you're standing on for today and for this week in the name of Jesus Christ. Tell me that. Yes. We know what they're doing. We read the Bible. We know what they're doing. We know what they're going to be doing. It's not new news. It's actually old news if you read the Old Testament. Because when you read the Old Testament, you're reading about America. You're reading about a new world order. We didn't have to have the old man, George Bush, the father, tell us that there's going to be a new world order. The book of Daniel already told us there's going to be a new world order. It wasn't new news. What to most Americans was like, oh my God, a new world order. Yes, there's going to be globalism. Yes, there's going to be a one world government. Yes, there's going to be a one world religion. Yes, but praise God, the early church lived under a world dictatorship and they turned the world upside down. Hear what I'm saying to you this morning. The church of God, hallelujah, the disciples, the apostles lived in a world dictatorship. There was a one world government, but what did they do? They praised God and they turned the world upside down. Death for right. Jesus Christ without electronics, without phones, without microphones. Amen. People. Negativity, doom and gloom. People can't wait to tell you doom and gloom. Sadness. Come on. Shake it off. It's like a cancer. Negative. Words out of their mouth. Oh, oh, oh okay. Oh, here it comes. Like a garbage peel lid that's come off. It's like this is not new news. Listen, we have to examine our heart and we have to ask what is this, what is uh, coming out of our heart? What are we distributing? Are we distributing spiritual nutrients? Are we uh, distributing spiritual vitamins to people? Are we giving hope to people? Are we distributing, oh, I saw a YouTube video. Did you see this video? I don't really care. I don't really care. Because I have a more sure word of prophecy. And that's what people do. They sit in front of their computer and all day they watch YouTube videos. Oh, what did she say? Oh, what did he say? What did she say? And what do you fill your mind with? By the time you go to bed, you're ready for a nervous breakdown, ready to go to the mental hospital. Someone has to rush you up there because you watch YouTube videos and you declare that must be true because they said it. Really? Do you know who you're watching? Do you ever Google some of these people that you follow? Do you ever do that? It's an amazing thing to do that because sometimes you find out like, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. Because you didn't inquire and you accept it as truth, some rumor mill, they'll, oh, I had a vision. I had a vision. And they're always wearing sunglasses and riding in the SUV in the Walmart parking lot prophesying. I don't yes. understand how they could do that. And in the middle of a prophecy, they'll say, oh, look at that lady over there wearing a mask. Oh, yeah, let's up to interrupt God to let us know that there's a lady wearing a mask. <laughs> Who cares? Wear 10 masks. They're going to lock us down. We're going to have to wear masks. Well, do we have to? Is that a law? Is that a law? <laughs> or a suggestion from some liberal person who's trying to tell us how to live and they can't even manage their own lives. Oh, come on now. The Bible says that not your heart be troubled. Don't let this cause inward commotion. Don't cloud in your mind and your spirit with garbage. No. Bring the word of the Lord no. into your heart. Yes. That's what God is trying to say. Don't be troubled by what you see or hear. What's troubling you at this very moment is a question that we all have to ask ourselves. What is it that's troubling you? What is it that's agitating you? And these are the things we have to get a hold of and bring under the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and put it under our feet and say, God, in the name of Jesus, I'm not going to allow this to trouble me. That's what God is saying here. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. 
That's eternity. That's positive. That's the word. That's a promise. Oh, man. What does it mean to believe in God? What does it mean to believe in Jesus? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. We must be persuaded that this book is true. Amen. We must be persuaded that this book is our spiritual compass to the next Amen. world. Amen. You were born to live forever. Amen. You were born for eternity. Amen. It's the conviction that God exists and he's the creator and ruler of all things. Amen. People want to tell us how the world began. How Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. Oh, it was an atomic bomb. Oh, no, it wasn't. Yeah, that's so stupid. It was an atomic bomb. An atomic bomb. No, it was fire and brimstone that God said, I'm done with you. Yeah. Two rocks colliding, that's how we got here. Mm. I don't think so. Amen. I didn't come from a monkey. I didn't come from an amoeba. I didn't come from a paramecium. I was created by God. Amen. In the beginning, God created yeah. the heavens and the earth. He spoke it. <laughs> but oh, YouTube videos. Oh, and listen. I, I had a laugh. I, I have a friend that I used to pastor. And his, his wife passed away uh, about a year ago. And she was a lovely lady, a good woman of God. And he, and he posted this thing about hell last evening. And this guy responds to him. And he says, I've been studying in the Bible since 1981, and there's no hell in the Bible. It's a myth. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> I, I just put, ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. There you go. I copied that scripture. Ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. And then I put the other scripture in how the God of this world has blinded the minds of people. There's no hell, he says. What, 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 it's mentioned 54 times in the Bible. Mm -hmm. right. What are you talking about? But he's been studying the Bible, listen to this now, since 1981, and I'm sure he makes YouTube videos trying to convince other Christians there's no hell. Well, what is it? Is this hell on earth? <laughs> I'm not getting it, fella. How can you study the Bible since 1981 and come up with that stupid conclusion? Right. Tell me. There's nobody in hell that wants to drink a water. Oh, I think there is. I think there is. Jesus gave us a story about that. That's right. Mm -hmm. The beggar, he went to heaven. Where did the rich man go? He said, oh, Lord, can I go back and tell my brothers? Oh, God, can you just dip your finger in, into a water and, and touch my leg? Oh, no, God said. There's no second chances. We don't believe in reincarnation. A lot of Christians do. So what are you going to come back as? Oh, I think I'll come back as a dog. I love dogs. Really? Really? We're so inundated with negativity. We have Christians reading horoscopes. Horoscopes. What's it going to be today? What, what, what am I in for today? What are you talking about? You're reading some dumb thing in a newspaper and that's what your life is about today? That's what you think is going to happen? Well, what is that, your guide? There's people in Hollywood that will not make a decision unless they talk to their astrologer. Really? Why don't you talk to Jesus? Why don't you talk to God? Why don't you go, praise God, have a conversation with the Lord, and maybe God can answer your questions, praise the Lord. Now, let me talk to you about this for a moment. God is saying this. Keep on believing in God and in me. And the question is this, when, question mark, continually and presently and in every moment of your life. Don't get waylaid. This is a command. This is a direct order, even when things seem on the verge of collapsing. It's a direct order. This could be our greatest moment to renew our faith in Christ and to be reminded that, praise God, even though this is a trying hour, hallelujah, God said we will overcome Amen. through the blood of the Lamb and by the Amen. word of our testimony. Amen. That's the power of God in our lives. Hallelujah. 
1 Peter 3.12 says this, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. And that's the problem today. People are afraid of the terror of the enemy. What they're doing. Jesus said, don't. Peter said, don't be afraid of their terror. I'm going to show you in a few moments that we should, the world should be afraid of the terror of God. Come on, that's right. That's right. Come on. And when you see how God is amazing, you'll understand. Mark chapter 10, verse 32. And they were on their way going up to Jerusalem before the crucifixion. And Jesus went before them. And look at the words. And they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. They were amazed and they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him. Saying, behold, look at the words now. Behold, we, we, not just Jesus, we go up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests, to the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him and they shall scourge him. They shall spit upon him and they shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. What kind of news is this? This is troubling to disciples that have walked with Christ for three years. You leave it? You're going to die? You're going to be crucified? You're going to be mocked? But here's what we're thinking, Jesus. You're going to take this one world government. You're going to dissolve it. You're going to put it under your feet. You're going to be the king of Jerusalem. And we're going to have all good jobs, 401ks, and good pensions. <laughs> they don't want to hear that. You're leaving? So soon? Three years? How can you do this to us? They were amazed, stupefied, with surprise, astounded, dumbfounded, feared exceedingly, had fright and terror. It's like, what's happening here? The same thing that's happening to us in America. People, what's going on? Well, the Lord have mercy. You know what's going on. When evil people rule, there's no peace. That's right. When evil people rule, they change the rules and regulations. And they call evil good and good evil. Come on. It's a two-tier justice system. You're the little guy. But we're little guys in God's army. And when you put all those little guys together, praise God, and we start to pray and shake the kingdom of darkness, something has got to happen. Hallelujah. Because God does hear our prayers. Hallelujah. Because he said, believe in me, believe in Jesus, and God will deliver. Amen. God will deliver. Yes. You're sitting here this morning. Look back on your life for a moment. Let God give you a flashback. Look all you've been through. Mm -hmm. Look all you survived. Yeah. Look at all you survived. Yeah. And you're here at church. Mm -hmm. Come on. Some of you have been through hell and high water. Some of you have been without, up the creek without a paddle. Come on. But you're here. You're still fighting. You're still here in the drumbeat of heaven. Don't allow that drumbeat to be drowned out. Amen. Come on. Or the nonsense of the enemy. Mm -hmm. We know he's up to mischief. He's a mischievous devil. Mm -hmm. He's a seducing spirit. Mm -hmm. We know that. He's evil. He's hateful. But his day is coming. Amen. Right. And he knows his time is short. So what does he do? He's pressing you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's pressing you. He's pushing every button he can in your home, in your family, with your kids. Every which way he's pressing buttons, pressing buttons, pressing buttons, trying to upset you. Trying to terrify you. Trying to make you go to bed with fear at night and so on and so forth. And they were afraid. What made the disciples afraid? They, could, they were concerned that Jesus had enemies that would kill him. He already said they're going to kill me. How much more plain could that be? Afraid because they were human and expected what they did to him, they would also do to them. And that's the fear. 
Some might be martyred. I don't know. We have brothers and sisters in foreign countries that are being martyred at this very hour. We have children that are being martyred in foreign countries. Right now, at this very hour, as we speak, hundreds every day. Millions have been martyred. The blood of the martyrs cries out from the ground, saying, Jesus, when will there be justice? And there will be justice. The cup is just about full. Praise the Lord. Afraid because they had plans of Jesus taking over and then having a significant place in the overthrow. The question this morning is this, what are you afraid of? What am I afraid of? What are we afraid of? It's the terror of God that we should be amazed at. It's the terror of God that we should be afraid of. In Genesis 35 and 5, and they journeyed. And the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them. And they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. Listen, God can terrify people. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 4, O God, your God is right there with you, fighting with you against your enemies, fighting to win. We are not fighting to lose. We're fighting to win. When we go on that playing field, praise God, we're not saying, okay, guys, we're going to lose today. No, you go out with the expectation of winning. Amen. What happens when you wake up in this morning? What happens when you put your feet on the ground? Some people, well, that's going to be a bad day. Yeah. I ran out of two pins. It's going to be a bad day. I don't have any coffee this morning. It's a bad day. I didn't have my coffee. It's still going to be a bad day. Self-fulfilling prophecy. And it turns out to be a bad day because that's what you're believing. That's what you believe in. And not only do you believe in that, but you go to other people where you work and your family, you know, it's going to be a bad day. Really? Why? It's going to be a bad day. Just trust me. It's going to be a bad day. This is gospel. Oh. Well, take your gospel and bring it somewhere else and come back, open the door, and bring your Bible. Listen, the great men of God, this one man went to visit this great man of God, and he wanted to meet him. And uh, he had a newspaper in his hand. And the man of God met him at the front door, and he said, uh, you can leave that outside. We don't let that in here. And the guy came in, and he thought he was going to have this great counseling session with the man of God. And the man of God opened up the Bible, and the man of God said, it's time to pray. And they, Prayed for a couple hours. And uh, he took a little break. And he talked for a little bit, not too long. And he said, uh, well, it's time to read the Bible again. It's time to pray. And the guys kind of looked at him saying, well, I, I didn't come here. I, I, I want to talk to you about headlines. I want to talk to you about what's going on in the world. I want to talk to you. No, no, no. He says, we're going to pray. We're going to seek God. And we're going to read the Bible and so on. You see, a lot of people don't want that today. You want the quick fix. That's right. Fix it, Lord. Fix it. No. You have to allow some people to go through it so they can learn a great lesson, just like you went through a lot of stuff to learn some great lessons. We want to rescue people. You can't. You can't rescue people. First of all, unless a person wants help, you're talking to the wall. As my mother would say, you're talking to the wall or am I talking like I'm blue in the face? You know what your mother meant. man. Am I talking to the wall, son? Do I speak Greek? Do I speak a different language? No, ma'am. You can't help someone that doesn't want help. They'll stay in their mud. Yep. Amen. A dog always returns to its own vomit. That's a proverb. Yep. You can only help people that are teachable, yep. that are open, that want to hear the word of God, and don't want to resist you and fight against you, and fight against the word of God that's in your life. You can't deal with it. You have to walk away. And it's hard to walk away and say, you know what? You're on your own. You're on your own. You can't fix it unless you really want help spiritually. Listen, we can go to councils. We can go to secular psychology and all this other stuff in the world and blah, blah. We can have motivated talks and pep talks and all this stuff. But you know what? When it comes down to it, it's at the altar in the name of Jesus Christ to say, God, I got a problem and I need some help. And I'm opening up my heart to you because, Lord, I'm frightened about what can happen to me in your kingdom. I'm not frightened about what's happening in the world. Lord, I'm terrified where I'm going to be going for eternity. People aren't terrified. God wants to restore fear in the house of God. Great fear came upon the early church. Today, we don't fear God. 
People don't fear God. Because if we feared God, we'd be at the altar. We'd be crying out to God. We'd be saying, God, take away everything that's not lovely in my life. Lord, everything that's anti-Christ in my life, take it away. And we wouldn't ponder about it. We wouldn't procrastinate and say, oh, and God wants to. God always wants to rid us of nonsense. And we use that as an excuse. Or God knows my heart. Yes, our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked until we find Christ and apply the blood of Jesus to our hearts. Come on. People are dilly-dallying about this stuff. <coughs> Contemplating their navel. Procrastinating. They don't have the fear of God. Let me tell you what God is saying this morning, and I believe this to be prophetic. God is saying, take care of unfinished business so that you are not a distraction. You know what I'm going to tell you? God is saying, prophetically, I believe this morning, take care of unfinished business so you are not a distraction. An admonition to get ready and remain ready. Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 5. Then the officers of the army must address the troops and say, has anyone here just built a new house but not dedicated it? If so, you may go home. You might be killed in the battle and someone else would dedicate your house. Has anyone here just planted a vineyard but not eaten any of its fruit? If so, you may go home. You might die in battle and someone else will eat the fruit. Has anyone here just become engaged to a woman but not yet married her? Well, you may go home and get married. Because you might die in the battle and someone else will marry her. Then the officers will also say, is anyone here afraid or worried? If you are, you may go home before you frighten anyone else. When the officers have finished speaking to their troops, they will appoint the unit commanders. What's happening here? God is an organized God. He's organizing his army. And if you have distractions in war, you're going to get picked off. And not only are you going to be picked off, but you're going to jeopardize the person to your left and to your right. Because people aren't taking care of unfinished business. There's so many people in denial. So many people lying to themselves every day. Lying, lying, every day, every day. God is saying, take care of unfinished business. Deal with it. You've often heard me talk about David and the five smooth stones. Why did he put five in his pocket, in his pouch? He only used one to kill Goliath. Because David did not take care of certain things when he was younger. There was five more stones for four more giants that were born to the giant at Gath. And David needed his army to kill the other four giants because he couldn't do it. Because he refused to do it when he was younger. He had issues. God loved him, but he had issues. We've got to clear up those issues. We've got to clear up those doubts and disputations. We've got to clear up unfinished business. And not dilly-dally. Because when God calls us to war, when he calls a soldier to war, and he's got a 50-pound backpack on his back, fighting an enemy, he doesn't need this guy over here or this guy over here dealing with unfinished business. Hey, I don't know if we can beat these guys. Dude, they're bigger than we are. They're giants. It's like, really? That's when sometimes friendly fire takes place. That's true. Because I'm not getting killed because of you. Same thing in the Christian army. Baggage. And we spend so much time trying to help people unravel their issues that they really don't want to unravel. They want to just stay put and justify their behavior. And as a result, it brings down the body of Christ. It brings down the church. It brings down their home, their family, and their children because they're justifying and rationalizing that what they're doing is okay. And when God is ready, listen, folks, God is always ready to help us. God is the God of battles. In Exodus 14 and 13, Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them no more again forever. The 
Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Exodus 15 and 3, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. God does go to war. And he goes to war with the idea of victory, Amen. not defeat. Sure. Exodus 23 and verse 27, I will send my fear before thee and will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. And I will make all thy enemies turn their backs unto thee. And I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before thee. God is so amazing. He can send hornets to defeat the enemy. Amen. Get it. Hornets. You can't fight a battle. Hornets. Where are they coming from? He said in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 24, And let it be when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that thou shalt bestir thyself. For then shall the Lord God go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord has commanded and smote the Philistines from Geba unto the place called Gazar. Praise God. Don't you hear the sound, hallelujah, of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees? Don't you hear the wind blowing this morning? The wind shall blow again my friends and it will blow upon us if we go forward and serve God with all of our hearts Hallelujah. it will take out what they're doing Amen. and replace it with what God's doing God's going to shock the world Amen. I said God's going to shock the world Hallelujah. Say it one more time. I said God's going to shock the world. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 27, Then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them to, to go again into Jerusalem with joy. For the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. And they came, praise God, hallelujah. They came with victory. They came with victory. But how do you get victory? It's what Jesus said. We, we go to Jerusalem. Now listen closely. The word we means together. God said through the prophet Amos in Amos chapter 6 and verse 1, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion, and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. I return to the walk to Jerusalem before the crucifixion for a reason. Woe. The word woe means alas, with, a, with an exclamation point. And it actually means, unfortunately and sadly, oh, woe to them. Sadly, unfortunately, many people in Zion have fallen asleep. I read the other day, which is quite hard to digest, that in the modern times here in America, in the last few decades, we have seen 25 million Christians fly the coop and no longer claim to be Christian. 25 million. Studies that are being done by Barnum, by different groups that are reliable. What, what are they doing? Where do they go? What do they now believe but nothing? The nothing gospel. We don't believe that anymore. People are writing books that years ago they wrote about Jesus and loving God and now they're writing books. I don't believe that anymore. I don't believe that anymore. You don't believe that anymore. How many years did you preach the gospel? What happened to you? Who seduced you? How did you fall asleep? When Amos said, whoa, it was a passionate cry of grief. It was a passionate cry of despair. And when he said, woe to those that are at ease in Zion, Resting, 
tranquil, secure in a bad sense. No earnestness. No prompting. No Holy Spirit invigoration. Hey, can't fight City Hall. Okay. So what happens in those days when people fall asleep? They become ambitious. They become ambitious. Doggy, doggy world. The survival of the fittest. You see what happened? The Bible says in James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Master, what would thou shouldest do for us whosoever we shall desire? And he said unto them, What would you that I should do for you? And they said, Grant unto us that we might sit one on the right hand and one on the left hand in thy glory. You see, the we was broken down. The we was broken down into individual people now. So what am I going to get out of this pie? What's going to be my position? And I think I deserve to sit on your left, and I think I deserve to sit on your right. What about your other brothers? You see, we become lone rangers. We become lone spokesmen for God. It's true. Because we become ambitious. And we jockey. That's why Paul said to the church when he was leaving in the book of Acts, he said, for three years I cried day and night that when I leave, the wolves will come in. The ambitious people. Not the we people. Not the people that want to be together. Not the people that want to keep the church intact. But the people who are ambitious, who want power and position and authority and tell people how to do it. The Jezebel spirit. The Absalom spirit of division. The Jezebel spirit of control. And Paul warned the church. But Jesus turned to these disciples and he said, he said, you know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And that's exactly what God is saying to us this morning. You see, because we've all been assigned a cup. Amen. It's true. It doesn't mean we have to like the cup. And it doesn't mean that we have to like what's in the cup. But if that's our assignment, that's it. You could try to trade your cup in, he's not going to take it. You could say, I'm not going to do it, and you can say, I'm not. That's up to you. But what's the end? What's the consequence? What's the result? Jesus was trying to tell him, listen, I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. And that's hard to process. I understand Jesus was saying. I believe. And sometimes it's hard for us to process also heaven. Right. It's hard to process. Yeah. Kids ask us, explain. I can show you in the word what it says. But I haven't been there yet. It's like explaining snow to someone that lives in Honolulu that's never seen snow before. How do you do that? Do you know what snow is in Honolulu? No, never seen snow. Well, let me try to talk to you about it. It's these flakes that come from heaven. Cornflakes? Rice Krispies? No. It's these flakes. And there's not one, two that are exactly alike. You're speaking a different language to someone that's never seen films, never seen snow, never experienced it. You're talking a different language to the person. God is saying, you want to know what the key is? And it's so simple that it bypasses so many people. What is the key? Jesus said, you know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them? 
But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Servant. My wife and I watched this film last night. It's called Divine Influencer. I think every kid should watch it. This young woman was given lots of money by her mom and dad, who were rich. She lived a very lavish lifestyle. And she advertised for these different agencies for clothes, and she was popular on the internet and got a lot of likes and all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Until she got a phone call from her mom and dad one day. Mom and dad were in France. And uh, we wanted to wish you a happy 29th birthday. Oh, thank you, Mom and Dad. But we want to say something to you. Your credit cards aren't going to work anymore. We're not putting money in your account. Well, wait a minute. It's my birthday. Yeah, we're cutting you loose, honey. Because we prayed, and we feel like the Lord told us to cut you loose. Because you have some lessons to learn. Okay. Happy birthday. I thought I was going to get a cake and some candles and a big check. No. Well, she found out real quickly she couldn't pay the rent. She found out real quickly she was homeless. Here's a woman of dignity. Beautiful clothes, jewelry, makeup. Very well known on the internet. Influenced a lot of people about fashion. Now she has no place to live. And you know where she ended up? In a homeless shelter. And she lied to get in there. She had a bed. And she was the resident advisor for all of these people in that area that were living there who were homeless. And the old woman that was one of the women in charge was going to show her her duties. Mopping, cleaning toilets, feeding other people, getting dirty. It's like, this is not me. Why am I doing this? Because your parents want to teach you a lesson that you're not the queen of the earth. And the world doesn't revolve around. Yeah. Well, through a series of whatevers, she finally found out about God. And the old woman said to her, just have a conversation with Jesus. Come on. You see, because she said, I used to be where you are today. And so are all these other people. And they know Jesus now. Because it's a Christian mission. And she's sitting by herself and she's contemplating and saying, this is not supposed to happen to me. I'm not supposed to be serving people mashed potatoes and food, and cleaning toilets, and living in a shelter. But you know what the end result was? She accepted Jesus and she fell in love with Christ. And she fell in love with servanthood. Think about that for a moment. Servanthood. Esteeming someone else better and higher than you. And willing to be inconvenienced to help another human being. Think about that. That's what Jesus was trying to say. Servanthood. So God is trying to say a few things to us this morning. He's saying, don't be terrified. Stay on the promises. Clean up unfinished business. 
Stay together. Don't become ambitious. That you become the Lone Ranger. And then God says this. Genesis 35 1. Divine leadership in the last day must speak truth and lead the people. God said to Jacob, Arise and go to Bethel and dwell there and make thee an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. <coughs> then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you. And be clean and change your garments. And let us arise and go to Bethel. And I will make thee an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. And they journeyed <coughs> and the terror of God they took care of unfinished business. They had superstitious relics and nonsense in their pockets thinking that this was going to save them. This was going to protect them. And they journeyed. When did they journey? After they gave Jacob their strange gods in their pocket and in their tents. And the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them. And they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. A little leaven leavens the whole one. And when we allow that into our homes, it poisons everybody. I told my wife, and I don't know the full meaning of the two words that I believe God has given me this week, because I believe God will reveal more. And here's the two words. Pay attention. Pay attention. I don't know what all that means yet. Perhaps God will unfold more. He says, pay attention. Hmm. Two words. Think about it. Are we paying attention? In our homes, are we paying attention? Are we paying attention? Our husbands paying attention to their wives. Our wives paying attention to their husbands. Our parents paying attention to their children. Our children paying attention to their parents. Our friends paying attention to one another. Or is it just mundane conversation? Hey, see you next week. Right. See you next week. How many times do people say, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Do you need anything? Do you need some help? See, the we gets broken down real fast. Mm. The we gets broken down real fast. When we become individuals. And we walk around with strange gods. Strange gods. And the strange god in society today is that thing that's controlling us. It's called the self. Think about it. I don't think some people can live without their cell phone if it fell somewhere in the world. I think they would have a nervous breakdown, and I think they would break the doors down of Verizon even when they were closed to try to get a phone. Think about it for a moment. Everywhere we go, we got a cell phone. A cell phone. And it controls us. And what's on the cell phone usually? What they're doing. And what do we do? We read what they're doing. And listen, we should know what's going on. I'm not saying no. But when that's all that we dwell on, and it gets into our spirit, by the end of the day, doom and gloom is over you, and your world is over until the next day, perhaps, when the sun shines. Divine guidance. Fathers, husbands, pastors, women of God, we need divine leadership. Why? Because we're going to face battles and we're going to face enemies. Deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 1. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and see horses and chariots and people more than thee, 
That's what's happening in America. You see, they got horses, they got chariots, and you can wave your hand now, and you can pay a bill. And oh my God, is that the mark of the beast? Jesus says, God says, be not afraid of them. Be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, is he not? Either he is or he's not. For the Lord God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Divine leadership brings hope and successful expectations. And it shall be when you are come nigh unto the battle that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people and say unto them, Hear, O Israel, you approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not. Do not tremble. Neither be ye afraid because of them. That's what I'm trying to do as a pastor. Trying to give divine hope and successful expectation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -mm. Four things. Don't faint. Fear not. Don't tremble. And need to be terrified. Deuteronomy 20 and 3, I'm going to read two different versions. He will say unto them, listen to me, all you men of Israel. Do not be afraid as you go out to fight against your enemies today. Do not lose heart or panic or tremble before them. That's what people are doing. They're panicking. What am I going to do? What am I going to What are you going to do? Dig a hole and go in it? What, 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 what do you mean, what are you going to do? We're going to serve God. Amen. We're going to go forward. He's, he'll say, attention, Israel. In a few minutes, you're going to do battle with your enemies. Do not waver and resolve. Don't fear, don't hesitate, and don't panic. And that's exactly what people are doing. They're panicking. They're panicking. Are we really living life anymore? Are we really enjoying life? Are we really enjoying family? Are we really? What are we going after? More money, position. And listen, if God wants to give you more money, he'll give you more money. But don't sacrifice your family for it. Amen. If God wants to give you position, don't be jockeying for it. God will promote you. That's right. Amen. That's the kind of God he is. He's always been that way. He's always been blessing to his people. He's always given to his people. But when we try to push it, we try to make it happen, it doesn't work out the way we expect. And then we get disappointed with God. This isn't all about war. It's all about war and warfare. Deuteronomy 20 and 4 says, For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you. He goes with you to fight for you against who? Your enemies to save you. In the easy version, it says this, For the Lord your God is going with you. He will fight for you against your enemies, and he will give you victory. Do we believe in victory? Or do we believe in loss or defeat? Let me try to close. God is saying a few things here this morning to us. He's trying to remind us. Yes, he's coming. I don't know when. Some people are saying, oh, on this certain feast day, the tribulation is going to start. You know what? Just leave me alone. Amen. Leave me alone. He says, occupy till I come. Amen. Enjoy a cup of coffee. Amen. Enjoy a, a jelly donut once in a while. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. Come on. We're so bogged down with what the world is saying that we're believing more of them than we're believing Jesus. True. And Jesus said, I'm with you. Amen. How much more can he True. tell us? Come on. Yeah. I'll terrify them. Listen, you don't think the enemy is afraid of you when you woke up this morning? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? You don't think the enemy is afraid of you? You think he wanted you to come to the house of God today and praise Jesus? You, you, are you serious? Come on. Do you think he wanted you to come here and worship God? No. He wanted God's job. And he hates when people worship God in spite of what we're going through, in spite of what's happening in inflation, in spite of what a can of tomato sauce costs. <laughs> By the way, $1.69. Enjoy your lunch with somebody. Enjoy a walk in the park. 
就业发展。Enjoy sitting on your back porch and just watching the birds and the bird feed. There you go. Just rest in him. And when someone wants to come with all the negativity, say, "Listen, I love you, but give me a promise. Give me a scripture." More than that, give me a prayer. Amen. Help me with a prayer. <coughs> Think about it. Buy me lunch. <coughs> Let's eat breakfast. <coughs> Let's rejoice about what the Lord's doing in our lives. That's important. Fellowship, breaking of bread, prayers. People loving one another because we're in a battle. I'm not minimizing that. And I'm not trying to deny that. But I like some of these verses that I'll close with. Psalm 511. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous with favor, wilt thou compass him as with a shield. Isaiah 37 and 31. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. And sister read this verse this morning in Psalm 91, verse 1. I have it here. He that dwelleth. In the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely He will deliver thee from the snare of the fowl and from the noises, noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth during the day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh unto thee. Isaiah 41 and 13, For the Lord thy God will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Genesis 28 and 15. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Exodus 33, 14. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give you rest. Jesus said in Matthew 18 and 19, he said, again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Go ye therefore, Matthew 28, 19, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Let me just interject one thing that I shared with my wife this morning. I heard a testimony of a man that actually records, said that he went to heaven. He wrote a book about it, Dean Baxter. <coughs> And the woman of God that was interviewing him asked him about prayer. And I can't say it exactly the way he said it, but it really touched my heart. You see, when we pray to the Father in Jesus' name, the Father receives our prayer, gives it to Jesus, and instantaneously, <coughs> spontaneously, angels are dispatched. Just like in the book of Daniel. Because God heard that prayer. And then God taps on people's shoulders to help answer that prayer or help that person that's been praying about a situation. And he said, he saw, he said, suppose 
people were praying for their city, say Detroit. He said it comes up to God. It's enormous. It comes up like that. And God sees the whole city just like that. It becomes so magnified. And what he was saying was, God knows every detail of your life. He knows you're coming and going, your ups, your downs, sleeping, getting up in the bed, in, in the morning, going to work, whatever. <clears throat> and all of this takes place because God is the God that's spontaneous. And he said something interesting, which is a great thought to process. He said, if you're praying for someone's salvation, he says, I believe that God will touch that person because you're praying for their salvation. And that's where the church doubts. You see, in the book of Acts, the Bible says our household. Yes. We doubt that. We dispute that. We allow negativity to come into our life and say, well, that's a hard case. Listen, so are you and I hard cases. That's right. That's right. Come on, we got some hard cases here. Yeah. <laughs> that God cracked yeah. the combination to your safe, to your heart. And God turned the tumblers. Yeah. And people said, she'll never get saved. That one, a little bucking bronco. Now when people meet you, they look at you like this. Ever seen them? They squint. They like it. And you're wondering, do I got a pimple here or something? They look at you. And they, <coughs> look, they say, who are you? What do you mean? I knew you before, but you're weird. Uh. You're weird. I hear you go to church. I hear you read the Bible. Is that true? What happened to you? Who got you? Oh, that's the great opportunity to say, Jesus found the combination to my heart. And he took those tumblers <coughs> to the right, to the left, and he opened and cracked that safe. And he came in and said, I want you. I want you. I want you, and he chose you. And that can happen to you, brother or sister. People are amazed when they meet you. And you've changed because they haven't seen you for years or days or months. Your demeanor is different. You look different. Your glow is different. Your walk is different. Your smile is different. There's a spark in your eye, a step in your walk. And they're saying, man, something radical happened. Yes, Jesus caused a revolution in my heart. And I'm no longer terrified about what God can do to me, but I'm rejoicing where God's taking me. Amen? Amen? Let us pray. Father, thank you for the word this morning. Thank you that you're so good to us. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the admonitions. Thank you for the warnings. But thank you, Father, that you're with us. Speak to us as a people, that you walk with us. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, Jesus said, believe also in me. So Father, I pray for each one in this house this morning. Whatever trouble they're going through, whatever we're afraid of, whatever fears we have to deal with, whatever unfinished business that we need to clear up, to march victoriously in this army together, help us. We need you. We want you. We want to be healed, body, soul, and spirit. And Father, we pray for those that would view this sermon or listen to it, that you would touch them in like manner. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming.